Um, I want to give a great, wonderful thank you to Gina for introduction for introducing me and giving me this opportunity to share with you all how I do my cut paper design. It really is a pleasure. It's a really detailed type of process to do, so I'm hoping that at least I'll get you started with doing one. And then if you don't finish, then you can finish it on your own. But before I go into that, as you know, this given workshop is called Mathematically Artistic and then some. Well, the reason why I call it and then some is because math and art, they just simply go hand in hand. And the and then some is the creativity element that we bring to it. So I'm gonna ask you all just to simply let your spirits be free to go ahead and create whatever comes to your mind. I'm gonna kind of walk you through some things, but you can use your own little essence to add to it at the same time. Before I get started with that, I wanted to show you also where you can also find art in different things. For instance, this particular structural sculpture, I found that at one of our little local Hobby Lobby stores. And this gives you a lot of geometry in here. You have your circle in the middle, you have your cylinder. And at the same time, you've got all the other, it looks to be like kind of rectangular shapes and so forth. But this is just letting you know that there's tons and tons of art around about you. Another example would be in these. I know that some of you see all the time when you go out different designs and things, that is your art also as a part of mathematics. As we scan over here, I wanted to show you some other things too. We look at our materials that we wear all the time, but we don't oftentimes think about them having geometry as a part of them. This happens to be an example of a mud cloth, mud cloth hat that I was able to purchase some years ago. And then also we have this given woven uh, kinte cloth. Also we have a woven and also it is um, it's embroidery on here, lots of unique designs as well using mathematics. You'll see the triangular, uh, uh, triangular design as a part of it and the circular design as well. Other examples of Kinte cloth, beautiful elaborate designs. There's a couple more here. And then this one I just quite love because it's really, really intricate. And as I said, I love to go to Hobby Lobby this happens to simply be a charger, and on the front of it, it was a fabric of um, kind of like a, a burlap cloth. And what I simply did was I used this given item to make the geometric designs on it. You have your circles, you have your triangles that have been rounded out, your diamond shapes. That's another example. And another thing I love to do is to go to estate sales or just any antique shows. This is a very, very nice piece that we were able to pick up recently. It has, of course, a square top. There's your mathematics in it. It has circles and squares embedded. It has little hearts. It has diamonds. It has all of that. So here's another example of using art and math together. Since it's Black History Month, I don't want to forget to note down the fact that we are celebrating that given month. And as you know, or maybe you don't know, the history of uh, the African slaves as they were trying to, to escape into freedom, this particular one here is referred to as the North Star. This is a cut paper pattern, believe it or not, but it's also always used in the quilts. And then we have this one too, it's called the flying geese, denoting that head, head north because when you go north to Canada, that's where you're going to get your freedom. Aside from that too, I've got a couple of more designs over here. I just want to give you a feel so you can see that art and mathematics really do go hand in hand. We don't think about it. We just simply see it, we like it, and then we normally end up buying it. Here's some other examples of Kinte cloth here. Another example too that's done with marker and another example here. Okay, that's just to give you an idea about how you can begin to view art when you buy something, when you purchase something, when you consider making it. There's like I said, lots of angles, lots of linear parallels, intersecting lines, all of that. We can't escape it. So without any further ado, I wanna go ahead and get us started. It's a quick review on the materials. Um, you should have something like cardstock, cardstock paper your black tag board also, a ruler, your eraser, your pencil, your scissors, and also, I cannot live without this. This is so important. This is the double stick tape because you don't want to glue everything down immediately. You want to go ahead and tag it in place, tack it in place, and then maybe go back and remove it or put it back or whatever the case may be. This is invaluable, you need that. Okay, some of the other artists that have influenced me with um, getting my creativity going, one of my favorite artists happens to be Vasily Kandinsky. 
He does a lot of abstract art. Another really, really great one, I just recently discovered him, I, I liked his work forever. His name is Victor Vasarelli, and his work is very, very, he's, he's known as a grandfather of optical illusions. And also if there's MC Escher that has his beautiful work that's out there too. So some of these artists you may be familiar with, some you may not, but I would like to really encourage you to look up Victor Vasarelli, uh, Wassily Kandinsky, and also please look up MC Escher for some of their work. Okay. Now let's go ahead and get started because time is gonna get away from us, but let's have some fun with it. So what I've done here, it may be kind of hard to see it. I don't know if you can see it or not. Okay, you can't quite see, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on to another one. Here's a piece here that I started to do, just to let you know that this is the same black tag board that you're going to be using to create your work on. But when you're doing it, I normally don't do the lines this dark. That's like I said, you could not even see these lines before. I would like to encourage you, don't make the lines too deep and dark because when it comes to erasing those lines off, it tends to leave a little bit of whiteness on your board. But I wanted to show you that these are different designs and so forth that can be created. I did the circular shape, there's your mathematics once again. These are actually triangles, but uh, not triangles, but rectangles, irregular rectangles. And if you look at the nose part, it's made up of triangles also, earrings or circles and whatever else. But whenever I'm creating something, I really don't think about it being created in terms of shapes and circles. I just create it because it looks pretty and it goes together, okay? Some other examples would be this given one here. And that's just a design with a lot of flair to it. Look at all the geometric designs, your rectangles, triangles, whatever the case may be. There's lots of things happening there and lots of energy flowing from it. And then I've got one more on this side. Initially, I thought I would love for these guys to do this. If you like this given piece quite a bit, I've got patterns for it. So I can go ahead and have Gina put it together for you and then maybe email it out to you or whatever the case. But this is really, really neat, but it's kind of intricate, so I decided not to do this given one. Instead, we're going to do something that looks like these. Okay. And in the very, very off center part, you see a cross that goes down here. And then there's my lines that are, are darkening in a little bit, so we can go back in and put the different shapes that go along with it. And this one. Nothing's glued down yet because I'm still playing around with it. But you'll see that the lines there, the lighter colored lines, those are where you're gonna take your paper and then simply cut it and put it into place. Okay, so let's go ahead and grab our paper, the black paper, as I clear my desk here. Grab your ruler and your pencil. Lisa, can I ask you something? Yes, please do. Um, so your artwork, it, resume, it reminds me of stained glass a lot. Um, yes. How did you start working with paper and can you talk a little bit about that history? I would love to. I first started dabbling with just simply using the black paper. You know, it was something different and unique because I used to only use white paper to color or not to color, but white paper to draw on. I said, well, let me try doing this. And so I went ahead and used the pattern notion for my stained glass to start doing it on this given paper. And then it ended up being something neat. I had my father-in-law say like, why don't you, why don't you do this more, but on a bigger scale? So that's what got me doing it much larger than the smaller versions of it. Okay. Very right. cool. Yes. Here we go. With your paper, please, in hand, hold it vertically. And what I want for you to do is take your ruler, place it horizontally on your page, and you're going to measure over three inches. At the very top of your paper, make a three inch mark. Go down and make another three inch mark. You're gonna do three of these marks. It's hard to see it. And also I should have told you at the same time to make three and three quarter mark as well. So you have a three inch mark and a three and three quarter mark. Okay, that's gonna be your vertical line that you're gonna use for your cross. Please go ahead, turn your paper and line up those marks and connect them. Once again, don't make it too heavily dark because otherwise it's gonna be hard to erase it later on. Okay, so when you look at it, you should have a line that looks like this on your page. 
continuing on, now take your paper, turn it horizontally. This time what you're going to do is measure approximately three and a half inches and four and one fourth. Once again, it's three and a half inches and four and one fourth. You're gonna do three of those. The reason why I like to do three of those because it really lines it up. If you do two, sometimes one is a little bit askew and it doesn't end up coming out to be straight. Okay, once again, connect those dots or lines of the marks that you made. Okay, so now you have a structure that looks like this. You have a cross on your page, okay? Now taking your paper, whenever I work with the paper, I tend to use a lot of colors. The reason why is because I want that contrast. I want the lights, I want the darks, I want the nuances between my greens and my yellows. And you'll see what I'm talking about here. So these are papers that I've already been cutting on and I'm notorious for not throwing the scrap paper away because you're gonna find that you're gonna need that paper, like that little baby strip or that little corner. So don't throw away any scrap paper because actually you can put it into your, your artwork and it makes it look really kind of neat. Okay, I'm gonna start off first by working on the vertical line that you see here, okay? And if you look at the colors that I've selected, when I talked about the difference in the, the greens and the, and the blues and whatever else, I like to have that variation of color because like I said, it adds a certain richness. And even with my blues here, like a little darker blue, it's not much different, but whenever you put it together and side by side, it makes your, your whole image pop a little bit more. And I also, I love, my favorite colors happen to be, you'll see in most of my artwork, I love teal, this color, I just can't get away from it, and my yellows. I love yellows and oranges and reds, anything bright. So I'm gonna use these colors. So since we're doing the vertical side of our design, and I do know that it measures approximately, let me go back, I think it's about three-fourths, yes. It measures about three-fourths wide. So I like to tell people to take the straight edge of your paper. You should have a straight edge because you haven't cut anything yet. So go ahead and measure three-fourths on that one. And by the way, I normally have my music going very loud. Um, and I'm normally not talking, but I solve a lot of world problems when I'm doing this kind of paper design. It's, it's a lot of fun, okay? So if you have any, any quandaries out there, just send them my way, I can tell you the answer. I'm just kidding. Okay, now with your paper and your scissors, your famous scissors, I have two different types of scissors by the way that I use. I love these little teeny scissors here. I don't know if you can kind of see them, but the, the tip of it's very, very fine. And these I like because I can do broader cuts with it. We're gonna use these right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this. And I normally do a lot of eyeing of things when I run cutting. So you're gonna see right now that it basically fits that given vertical line, but I'm not gonna keep it like that because you're gonna see it's so much better if you can add a little bit of design in with it as you're creating it. Like if you notice on this one, I decided to put an angle in there. And on this one, I put a, sort of a partial circle in with it. So once again, using your creativity and the colors that you wanna to put together, you can create whatever you want to create. But right now, I'm gonna take this and use this pencil here and just simply do a bit of an arc with it. I'm gonna cut it. Hey, Lisa, Lisa, we have a request. Yes. To go slower. Oh, okay. I'm notorious <laughs> for doing that and I am so sorry about it. I, I wish mean, I were... we, we only have so much time, but. <laughs> yes, I wish I were in person with you that way I would go slower and I would be walking around. So thank you for that. I will slow down. <laughs> Okay, using this special tape, double stick tape. I'm going to go ahead and I normally put the tape in the mid section of it because I sometimes slide paper underneath it whenever I'm putting other pieces with it. So I just simply tape it in place like that. 
excuse me. Now what I want to do is add a little bit of red with it. I'm trying to slow down. I'm sorry that it's going fast because I know that I'm kind of crunched on time here. Okay. You're going to see that I simply placed the red paper underneath and I went ahead and marked it off. I marked it off. And now because it doesn't fit perfectly, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to take my pencil and the curvature part there, I've drawn the pencil mark there. It's kind of hard to see it, but I made a pencil mark on it. I don't know if you can see it or not. And now what I'm gonna do is cut that. When I do my cut paper design, the same thing with stained glass. Notice how it always has that lead part. That lead part delineates one piece from the other part. Well, with cut paper, the black is acting as though it's actually the lead. So I'm gonna go ahead and use my tape again. Oh, that's really interesting. The paper is acting as the lead. Yes, yes. Um, I had someone here, uh, Maria Lana Queen. Yes. She says she works with your sister Pamela, and she's really hi. inspired. <laughs> hi there, Maria. It's, uh, good. it's good that you're joining us. Um, she's asking if you can clarify um, if you can maintain the revert re the tape as opposed to using glue. So I guess, can you use just the tape or, or do you also need to use glue? Um, the tape is right now just to adhere things to the page. And the glue is very important because later on, it just keeps everything in place. I've known this to kind of flip up if you see. Right. It just flips up. So you don't want that happening. You want it to be all the way, you know, stuck down and adhered to the paper. So we're just kind of designing right now and sticking yes. and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, as you can see, we have this going at the very top of it. And because I want the red to have more of an essence and pop to it, I'm going to now taking the straight edge of my paper and then on the horizontal part that goes across here, I'm just going to go ahead and lay it down. And once again, it's three quarters of an inch. Thank you guys. And I want that to be my central focus on the cross. So I'm just simply gonna go ahead and cut that. And I'm gonna put a little, a little curvature to this one as well. And you're gonna see that as you do the different cuts in your paper, it makes it, um, it kind of makes it sing and hum to you. Like case in point back here, when I was doing some of these initially, you'll see that the designs, like the straight lines, but then I kind of put other rectangles and linear lines in with it or a circle and then on top of it, I put something else. Or with these linear lines, I put a curvature with it. So you don't have to feel stuck into just making your line straight. As I said, the curves kind of give it a bit of life in it and in, in movement to the actual design itself. Okay, using this one that I just cut right now, I'm going to put it down. And like I said, I want it to, to move. So I'm gonna put another little, and it's gonna go thinner. And as I cut it, you're gonna see what I'm talking about here. Okay, do you see what's happening there? Not that I'm gonna get rid of this part, I'll use it elsewhere in my design but I just simply cut it away and it gives it a different feel. And because as I said, I want the red to be the focal part. I'm now gonna go ahead and have it overlap the midsection. And the piece that I just cut off, I'm now going to use it further down in my design. So now you have something like this going. And like I said, if I don't like that shape, which right now I'm not really feeling it a lot, I know I'm gonna come and cut that part because it's just not talking to me. So. 
a lot of my designs as I do them, I normally do it, I, I put the tape on it, I step away from it. Sometimes I don't return to it for like maybe a day or two because like, I mean, it's overwhelming because you see so much that you wanna create with it, but you know, it's not saying what you wanted to say. So I step away from it. I think most artists tend to do that. Now it has a different message going with it. And I'm gonna come alongside it here with maybe something orange and then maybe not exactly red next to it, maybe a little bit of orange there and then some more red and then some yellow. Does anybody have any questions? Um, Lisa, we have one of our instructors asking, yes. um, so the choice for paper opposed to the stained glass, is it, was it because um, the equipment to do the actual stained glass is prohibitive? Um, no. Um, I stopped doing stained glass when I became pregnant, that was some years ago. And the reason why is because the lead, um, at that given time I was using lead and that lead is not good for your unborn child. And so I stopped doing the stained glass. I still have a lot of glass left and I still wanna get back into it. It is probably a little bit more costly because you have your copper and then your grinding wheel and then you've got all these things that go into it. You've got to have your nails, your board. There's a lot of things and plus you have to have it framed out. I've got a piece actually back behind me if I could just show you real fast. It was my first piece, believe it or not. This piece here. It's a little see. hard to see. Yeah. It's hard to see it. Well, it's, it's actually two, it's two love doves. And I knew that I had the artistic ability to do it, but I didn't want to pay somebody all that money to do it. So I took <laughs> the class for $50 and I ended up getting the scale. And for years and years for Christmas presents, I would give away stained glass pieces or whatever the case may be. Um, but it's just a lot of fun to create like that. But I mainly do... I mainly gave it up because of the lead hunting. And I do paper because it's quick and it's easy. When I, I shouldn't say it's quick and it's easy, it's quicker and it's easier than um, doing the doing the stained glass. And it's just safer. It's for safety right. reasons. And I have to admit, there was there was a point in time. Um, I was rushing to get a piece done and I didn't have my goggles on. And I was just kind of, I'm going to do a quick little grind, just get the edge down and a little fleck of glass kind of like landed right in the corner. Oh, no. And so I was like, oh, I better wear my goggles for now on. So that's the main reason also, aside from it being the lead. <laughs> okay. um, there's a second part to the question if you're yes. open to, um, is, so I guess it wasn't the cost really that was prohibitive, but I guess if it was for somebody, um, would it be something like a home ceramic studio where people pour, pool their resources or like a school or community center? Um, I guess they're asking how can um, pe people kind of do this on, on, a, on a budget or? The, the stained glass on a budget? Mm -hmm. um, like well, by pooling, uh, getting together with each other or? That's quite doable. I do know that there's a shop over where I live. It's called Hand of Man. I don't know if she gives classes or not, but I actually took a class with someone by the, from a studio that was called Classica. They were, oh, they were on a mission. I so actually, I was, yeah. Did you know him? Um, I knew people who worked there. Yes. You know what? Actually, I was always in the studio so much they thought I worked there. Oh, wow. I, was, I was answering the telephones and doing all sorts of things just, just so I could get some studio time, but they didn't mind it. It was so helpful. I learned so much from them because they knew how to do it. Right. Yeah, but it's not really as expensive as much as most people think it may be. You know, it's, I mean, I, I don't know what you consider to be expensive. Any right. Hobby, A lot of any art hobby. is. Huh? <laughs> A lot of art is, it comes with the territory, right? Yes, it does. I guess the uh, last part of the question is, um, you kind of mentioned with Glassica, uh, where did you do stained glass and for how long? I did stained glass from 1985 to 1990. And then I did a little bit more thereafter because I would make some pieces for people um, after my baby was born. So I did it maybe until like 1993, 94, something like that. The now my job is also working as a teacher. So right. you know, art is always done on the side, <laughs> especially over here. That's what I was thinking. The paper seems a little more immediate and um, 
doable when you're teaching full time and I'll tell you yes okay I'll stop interrupting you for a second oh no it's no problem <laughs> I, I really like you asking questions do you have a question if the larger frame it behind you is for sale <laughs> and if it not actually is for sale if you want to visit my website you're more than welcome to it's uh, Lisa Irby Art and it is for sale um check it out <laughs> it looks really beautiful in your home. <laughs> I really had the privilege as of late to, to, to gift my sisters with some of my artwork. And I, you know, I've always given them things because I just love them so much and everything. But these, these sisters are so dear to me. So I gave them um, one was called The Essence of Beauty. It's actually on the website. And the other one is, um, oh gosh, the name's slipping me right now. I can't remember right now. Oh, do you remember the name of it? Okay, anyway, I, I gave those to them because they it, it spoke to them. And one of them actually looks like one of the, the the art pieces. That's why she got it. And the other one, it was because it was it was um, her time for retirement, and this was kind of symbolic of her next steps. You know, oh, when she's going to be journeying. So very nice. This I've done so far. You can see where it's kind of taking up and picking up a little bit of energy. And I still feel like I want to put other something in here as well in this red part of it. Like I said, I put the stickiness on the back of it because if I don't like it, I can always go back and cut it out and change it back. Okay, so let me go ahead and move forward to a couple that are almost done. Okay, let's look at this one. This one's almost done. So what I wanna show you right now is how I block in the larger pieces of it, okay? And as you can see, it has multiple colors. I think at least seven or eight colors that I have going here. So I'm going to, to me, I'm examining it to see like what color do I want to, to speak to me. And I think I need something green and vibrant. So I'm gonna choose this piece. And when I do it, because it has the straight edges also already in place, I'm going to go ahead and just line it up with that edge. And I do, like I said, a lot of eyeing. When you sent the images um, through email, yes. gorgeous, but I had no idea how beautiful they were until we were hanging them. And Thank you. there's just so much texture to them and I can't even explain it, but they're beautiful. And then some of the, I remember you telling me that um, some of your acrylic paintings, they start as um, just ab abstract expressions and then slowly yes. they form into these ideas. And yes. and then I saw you took some of those and incorporated them into the cut paper designs. So it was like even a step further, it was so beautiful. Thank you. I, I really enjoy creating things. Um, a lot of my inspiration comes from, from my belief as a Christian. My, like this, the inspiration behind this one that you have, I have behind me, it's, there's a cross in it. And you'll see there's a lot of symbolism with my artwork because I feel like there's this message that I need to share because it's so much a part of who I am. I know in this day and age, a lot of people are like, oh, no, don't talk about, well, it's who I am. This is really who I am. And my art speaks to the heart of who I am which is I love Jesus Christ. And so this particular piece, as you see here, when I started doing it, it was supposed to be these quadrants. There was a quadrant here, a quadrant there, and there and there. So it's gonna be four across, another four, another four, and another four. And I had to step away from it because it was it was overwhelming to me because this I just can't do this thing, I, I don't wanna do it. So when I came back to it, I began to all of a sudden put in the sun. And then from there, here comes this person that's coming out from who knows where. And this is actually Jesus here. And if you focus in down here, you see there's a person. And this person has their arms out like this. And there's another person. They share the same head. So this person's head that's actually ministering is also helping to care for someone who's kind of seated like this. And so he's wrapping his arms around him, saying, like, I'm right here with you. You're not in this by yourself. We can walk through this together. Well, as a Christian, what happens with me and those others that are believers, Christ lives within us, so we can't help but help other people. We're his hands, we're his feet, 
We're his mouthpiece. We're meant to share him. And so all these little round circles, that's like the Holy Spirit that's moving around and about. And then you see here, there are these lights, these candles. And then this is a hill. And it's symbolic, basically, of us being lights on the hill, putting our message out there to the world, shining brightly. This particular one is called Sun, which is Jesus Christ, the Sun, Sun to Sun. Because as you know, the Sun gives us light and life. Well, Jesus Christ, for me, gives me light in my spirit. He gives me light. And there's a cross right here, which was not intentional, but it ended up coming out as well. So a lot of my work when I'm creating it, I don't really know how it's going to turn out. It just sort of evolves and it becomes this thing. And it just happens. So like with these, these just happen. It's really neat. I love the intuitiveness of it and um, a message kind of working through you. It's such a, um, I don't think that can be taught, right? Well, <laughs> I, I guess. Well, I think I think all of us have it in us, but are we listening? I think true. we can do it. Yeah. We just have to kind of step back and get away from ourselves long enough to, to see what's what's going to come out of us. We've got a voice, but what is that voice saying to us? Is it giving positive stuff, negative stuff? I choose to to believe that I'm in that positive voice. I've got a lot to share, and my artwork is one way that I go about sharing it. By the way, speaking of being a little bit too close, it's kind of hard to see, but here it's too close. You can't even see the delineation. And I want it, I want it to show up. So I'm going to now go back in and trim it off. And you're going to see how it pops a little bit more because I'm trimming it. I don't know if you can see it or not. Can you see that? All right. I can do this forever and ever. So if you have any questions or if you want to know anything, I mean, I'm, I'm an open book right now and I'm feeling happy that you guys have joined me here today to learn how to do this. I would actually love to sit with you all and show you how we can create these things. Because I mean, there's something about being around other artists and you're just kind of letting it flow and you're talking or you're not talking or you're listening to music and it just sort of happens and it, and it comes alive. Do you have a question from Danielle? She says, what do you like most about being an artist? I like the freedom. <laughs> I like the freedom because like sometimes um, I'm fortunate to have a space in my house where I can, I can go and I can work. And sometimes it hits me at like two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning. Like if I wake up and I'm like, yeah, my mind's going, Prr. you know what? I can't sleep. So I come up and I can do art whenever. Whenever I was teaching, because you have to really be present and awake and energized to handle the students in the day ahead of you, then you, you can't wake up at two and three in the morning and do that. So I like the freedom of being retired and then just to be able to create whenever I want to create. I'm always doodling. I've got this one book, I can't find it here. This book here, anything that has a surface on it, I'm gonna draw on it. I don't know if you can see that or not. But anything with the surface and blank pages, I'm gonna be drawing and doodling. And as you can see, this is probably going to end up being another one of my cut paper designs in, in the near future. So my thing is work, work when you can work, but when it's time to retire, like me, retire <laughs> and do your passion because life is not over just because you retire. I'm a grandma too. I love being a grandma. It's like one of my favorite things. My grandson loves to come to the art room and he's always up here and when we were preparing to do this, he sat over here and goes, okay, I said, Rome, what are we gonna tell him? He goes, okay, everybody, you're gonna need your, your scissors and you're gonna need your, your colored paper and your glue. And we're gonna do today, cut paper designs. And I was like, look at him cute, he's three years old. Um, I would love to show you his design, but I don't have it at my fingertips, but he just, I love it. And I'm able to pass that on to them, that love of, of creating, because everybody has that ability to create. Oh, thank you. Here's what he did. I mean, this is, he's only three. Oh, that's adorable. And he, he's cutting paper and he knows it. He would always say, well, are we going to paint here or is it cut paper? Which one are we going to do today? And so if a three-year-old can do it, anybody can do it. Thank you. I 
I wonder how their designs are coming along. Does, has anybody given me any feedback? Are they trying to create something too? I think of um, some of the people are. Um, so tell me how's it going? So, so uh, from Taylor, they're asking, um, how do you, I think you mentioned this in the beginning, but they missed it. How do you plan out your cut paper design specifically? How do you start? I missed the first few minutes of your presentation. No problem. I'll be, happy, I'll be glad to go ahead and share that. Um, I just take the black paper and then I sketch out very lightly a little bit of a design. Like on this one here, this is much darker than I normally would do, but I just sketch something very lightly and then I go ahead and I create from there. Let me show you another one here. Do these designs come from sketches or do... Just out of my crazy <laughs> imagination, like, like this one, if you can, it's kind of maybe hard to see it. Can you see it? It's a young girl that's sort of a, she's kind of playing around. There's a sun in there. Always the sunshine. I believe in that light. And she's got her big hands out. Like, I'm here to help you. I love you. I don't know if you can see it or not. And then here's another one too that I, I did, but it's not done yet. It's kind of hard to see it. Like I said, I love this, this black paper. And I've got another couple in here too. This one may be harder to see. I don't know. Can you see that one? This one I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up doing because I can see where I can put a lot of detail with it, overlaying the colors one on top of the other. And here's one more I wanted to show. Okay, this is a heart. Um, I think it's currently on display right now, if I'm not mistaken. Can you see the heart and then all the different little designs around it? And the real beautiful thing is I incorporated this without really thinking about it. I incorporated it into one of my other cut paper designs. Um, it's called the Heart of Humanity Begins at the Cross. And that is really kind of neat because it always has people's faces and heads so in the corners, I've got four different ethnic groups. And then there's a, there's a cross with, that's very multicolored, similar to this one, but the design's a little bit different on it. And then in the very central part of it, it has this, this heart, not this one, but one that's very similar to this one. And it's made up of reds and oranges and so forth. But like I said, when I do it, I don't aim to make it look a certain way. It just sort of kind of flows out and becomes this, this image that I want to share out with people. Are we Good, I think we have about uh, 15 minutes. Okay, super. So we're gonna keep on creating some of this because I wanna show us how we can begin to glue down some of this too. And let me just finish this last piece. There's another question. Um, did you study art or are you self-taught? Um, your work and where you find inspiration is incredible. Thank you. Um, I did actually, I, from the time I was in kinder, and I've got a really long story with that, but I'm not gonna share it with you, but I had a kindergarten teacher. And I think really she was one of the reasons that got me started with education also, because she knew and she understood that this busy little mind of mine, which was just turning and turning, even in kinder, she could see that. We had nap time, we were supposed to go to sleep. I couldn't go to sleep. And so she was like, you know, hey Lisa, do you, do you, do you wanna draw? I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. She gave me five sheets of paper, colored markers, sent me the big, huge, giant teacher desk. I mean, they don't have those anymore, those wooden thick desks. And she says, as long as you don't talk, you can go ahead and create whatever you want to. And so I covered every single white paper like this, covered every single one. It's just, oh my gosh, this little girl, no wonder. So when you say, am I self-taught? I think that God's given me this gift to create and to make things. And so I've always done it. I've done it ever since kinder all the way through high school. In junior high and high school, I did art. In my high school, we could actually major. So I majored in Spanish and I also majored in art. Once I graduated from um, high school, I went to the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale and I studied photography. Talk about an expensive hobby. That's what's expensive because we had developing paper and we had the chemicals and then of course the film. That was super expensive and I couldn't afford it. So I returned back to my home state and I went ahead and I did the studies, got my degree, ended up teaching, 
you know, doing counseling. And then, but the art was always tugging at me. I need to do my art. So that's where I got my art from. My training was minimal in terms of me going to school to be an artist. I think it's a God gift that he's given to me. All right, we're gonna start gluing down some of this because I want to see how we match watch it. Even though it's not complete, it's something for us at least for you to see the process of once it's all completed. And I really don't like these big chunky things here. It feels like it needs something to be overlaid on it, but because as I said, time is kind of getting away from us, I want you all to see how the process actually goes. So moving this out of the way. The glue we're going to use, and you've got to be careful with your glue. I'm, I'm making a discovery as of late that the type of glue that you use, um, I use this because if you put it down, you can peel it back up. Some glue, you put it down, then the paper sticks to the paper. But this one tends to, if I put it down, I don't like it. I can take a little exacto knife and kind of scrape it and lift it up, and then I can, then I can go ahead and, and, and replace it with something else. Okay. So when I do this, yes, please, whatever you do, remove this tape. I'm just gonna simply put it. I'm gonna put it on this. And with your glue, you don't want to put too much glue because sometimes it oozes out. So what I've done is I've stuck some glue onto it. I don't know if you can see that very well or not. And I'm gonna go ahead and put it in its place. And I press it down. Some of the glue may ooze out from the side, but that's okay. But don't, you don't want too much of it oozing because it's gonna get real messy if you let that happen. And then sometimes whenever you pull up your, your paper, the tape might stick to it. No problem. Just pull it up. What kind of glue are you using? This is Elmer's No Wrinkle Glue. And I've had to actually order this online because unfortunately the hobby stores here, they don't carry it. So you get a better deal actually if you order it online too. And I normally get it in bulk. Sometimes four tubes or six tubes. They sell like in a little case like that for me. Um, but I don't know why they've not been carrying this glue, but I, I really like this glue a lot. It doesn't wrinkle the paper? Is yeah. that why? Exactly. But another question after doing um, about stained glass, after doing stained glass designs on paper, which do you enjoy more, stained glass or the stained glass effect on paper? I really like doing stained glass because you have to cut the glass, you have to break the glass, you have to shape the glass, and you've got to you have to grind it, then you have to foil it, and then you have to place it, and then if it doesn't fit, then you've got to go back and grind it a little bit more. That process, it feels like I'm I'm putting more of me into it. I mean, I am doing it with this as well, but then you can put up that piece to the window, and the light shines through it. There I go again with my light. The light shines through it, and it has these beautiful reflective tones that are hitting the carpet or the ceiling or whatever the case may be. And it just has it speaks to you. So I like them both, but I like this one because it's cheaper. <laughs> it's cheaper. <laughs> I wish I could see you all. Also the, it being on paper, mm -hmm. somehow like with stained glass, cause I've no, no, we've thought about having like a stained glass exhibit, but you have to have a light box and you have to, yes. um, but for some reason the paper, it seems to like kind of emanate light. You know, I don't why? know if that makes sense. But. Well, I, I would agree with you because once you put the Mod Podge on it, it it's it's kind of it makes the colors more vibrant. I mean, I don't right. know if you can see the difference between this without the Mod Podge. Right. It just makes it more rich, and uh, 
I don't know, it just kind of speaks to you. You can see like little angles and little flex. Another thing too with my paper, it's not all smooth paper. Some of it is texturized. So you get like little bumps and grooves and whatever else with it. Yeah, that was one of the nice things about seeing it in person, all the texture and mm -hmm. grooves and... Um, I'm used to not working so fast. Um, I have uh, one person, Richard, he says, I didn't have black paper, so I made it with dark blue. Oh. I'm making a purple, pink, and yellow cross. Oh, that sounds lovely. Hey, Richard, can you submit it to Gina so I can see? I would like yeah. for everyone. Yes, whatever you guys are working on, it would be so nice if I could see your work. I mean, because remember, it doesn't have to look exactly like mine. Richard, I like that. I've never used blue paper. So you might have given me an idea. How much do I owe you? <laughs> That's a good idea. I just use black because black is rich. You know, is it, you said it's a navy, a dark blue? Dark blue, yes. Okay. And um, just a request, if you could repeat drawing the, I guess, the the lines and the spaces outside of the cross, how you went about doing that. Oh, and yeah, then okay. also, um, since you're creating as you go, how do you know when the piece is finished? Lisa, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know that it's done because remember I said I look at the piece and then I step away from it and then I go downstairs and maybe I come back a day later and I look at it. I'm like, oh, mm, like it needs something. And then it, it, it's almost like the piece talks to you and it tells you like I'm done. This is, this is, you don't want to do any more because any more is going to, you're going to mess up the message. And so I just let the, the piece talk to me. Like this one right here, this is not done because I'm used to having more layers with it. Like in the yellows, it needs something more. Like, I don't know if you can see this one or not. I put some little flecks in here of like a purplish color. And then there's another purplish color. But I, I think it still needs a little bit more. And I even want to bring it down into this space. So that's one thing you've got to think about with, that you can do with paper that you can't do with stained glass. Because you can actually cross over lines. I don't have anything that's like, like bubbled up or anything like that. But it crosses over and it's adhered to it. But it makes it pop a little bit more. So that's kind of fun with it. OK, what I'm going to do, because I think that time is almost, um, yes, it gives it more dimension is what I'm talking about. Um, I hope that helped out a little bit, but they wanted to know how did I do the lines. Okay, down here, I just made chunky lines and I did it based upon the overall of the, it's like it has a couple of designs within itself. It has the sun and then it has the cross. And I decided to just make the lines based upon those two given dimensions put together. And what I do is it just flows out from that main source. It's like a puzzle piece that's being put together. And you, it's gonna talk to you, like I'm, like I'm telling you, it's, it's kind of weird when I say this is gonna talk to you, but it says, mm, that fits or no, that doesn't work. And if it doesn't work because you're using your eraser, a light type of pencil and you can erase it, you can sim simply erase it. And with the pa cut paper, if you don't like that shape, you can recut it, okay? But I just simply just put the lines in to give me the energy that I wanted to have. And I keep talking about this yellow. Let me show you what I'm talking about, how it's going to transform that given shape. Okay, I don't know if you noticed, I just simply sketched out something. I didn't even put a measurement with it at all. And it's a triangular shape. Okay. I'm going to focus in on this one, this particular ray that's coming out from the sun. And I'm going to put a bit of red with it. And like I said, it just gives it more depth and more dimension. And if I feel like it, I can even go ahead and put like a little strand of orange with it. 
And do you see how it makes it pop a little bit more? And to give it some more essence, I maybe I don't even want it to be that thick. Maybe I just simply want it to have like a little bit. You're not tied into any particular size. You, you put down on the paper whatever you want it to feel like. A question, do you ever listen to music while you work? And if so, what are your favorite jams? Okay, Christian music, I love that. And I, I like jazz. I love to hear jazz. And then sometimes I hear like really like country music. <laughs> um, whatever I'm in the mood for that day, I have a, a pretty eclectic when it comes to the music that I listen to. I don't do heavy metal and stuff because I just, I'm not a headbanger. I just, it makes my head hurt. You know, my kids laugh at me. Guitar music's too loud. Just turn it down. Okay, please. Yeah. Look at the difference of this and the other. You can do that. You can do that design with it or that design with it. It just depends on what you want it to say. You can do it on all of those and then maybe come back in with another thicker piece on it as well. Okay, like I said, what I do want to do, because I don't know how much time we have going here, I want to show you how to Mod Podge it. Okay. Um, I like Mod Podge because it, it's, it's uh, the one that I'm using is uh, the Gloss Luster. This, there's another one too, it's a yellow one, but I like this one. It's a bit thicker and it also just makes the pieces like really, it tacks them in place really nicely. And like I said, for those of you that want this, I've got the pattern for this one. This is what we were going to do, but you'll see a lot of symmetry with that one. Um, it's really fun. So, but like I said, the Mod Podge makes everything stick in place and plus it hardens it and makes it more um, durable. Okay, moving this aside and it's not all the way dried yet. I normally wait till everything's completely dry because as you know, if you put glue down and it's not all the way dry, and then you put another glue on top of that, chances are you're gonna get some air pockets and it's gonna be kind of warped and things like that. So I normally wait till everything's completely dry. And when I say wait, I'm talking about maybe at least two days. I mean, I just wanna make sure because sometimes I layer one piece on top of another piece on top of another piece. And if I don't have it all the way dry, then what's gonna happen is it's gonna either buckle up and peel up and it's gonna look really bad. That was another thing I wanted to share with you all. Um, when you do your pieces, if you use really broad pieces and your paper is very thin, even though this says non-wrinkle, if your paper is not real thick, it's going to kind of, it's going to buckle a little bit. So I would encourage you to minimize how wide you cut your pieces of paper because if they're too wide, it's going to, it's going to mess up your whole design. It's going to be kind of ripple in there. Okay. All right. When I use my paint brushes, um, these are my acrylic paint brushes. I just wash them out really, really well. And I like the broad, flat brushes. Um, I just like the feel of these. Um, they're not the thick ones. They're not the, the real bristly type ones. They're just very silky type of brushes. And the reason why I like these brushes is because whenever you paint on the um, Mod Podge stuff, it, it just goes on very smoothly. And I normally kind of go in one direction with it. Or if it's a circular thing, I go in a circle with it. Depends on how the design, because once again, like you said, uh, Gina, it looks like it's kind of coming at you. Well, that's because of how the Mod Podge is also laid down. Okay, is it either one of these? I'm gonna use a smaller one because the design is not that big. Okay. I hope everybody's enjoying this. I am. I'm having, I am. I'm having a really good time. I was, I was like, oh, I don't know how to do this because I'm, I'm used to talking to students and walking around and moving around and doing stuff with them. But this is this is kind of nice, I like it. Okay, put just a little bit of glue, Machi Podge stuff onto it. And it has a certain aroma. So if you're, if you're really sensitive to smells, make sure you have your fan going. It's not toxic or anything like that. But if you have a sensitivity to, to odors, make sure that you have a window open or you have your fan going. Okay. This has never given me a headache like some things do. So when I apply it, I just simply, with the cross, because I want it to go down, I'm going to apply it straight down. 
And I'm not going to do the full thing because I'm not finished gluing everything in place. And maybe by the time we're done, I'm going to cross because then I'm going to go back around it. And make sure that you get in between where the black is. I don't know if you can see that or not. Can you see it, everyone? Because I have a bit of a light here. Okay. And I'm going to lay it down so I can really make sure I have it all covered the way it needs to be covered. I know I did some of the green, so I'm going to do this. And if you put this on too thick, you're going to see um, a 3D effect with it. So you don't want it to be too terribly thick. Let me see that. Can you? And then you're going to let it dry, and then it becomes something that looks like one of these that you see here. Okay, when it comes to circles, I just, yes. Oh, I just said beautiful. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> when it comes to circles, um, my circles aren't perfect, but I, I like to do circles. This one young lady that I'm working on creating here, there she is. It's a necklace type thing. And I'm gonna go ahead and continue that pattern of the necklace. And it just feels like it needs to have, I'm gonna go ahead and do a yellow to continue somewhat of a pattern, but it's not gonna be a full pattern because I'm gonna put something else on top of these. And it might be a circle that's kind of off to the side. So when I do my circle, I just kind of eye it, take my paper, create the circle more or less the size I think it should be. Lisa, a technical question. Can you use yes. spray Mod Podge? I've never used spray Mod Podge. I think it's like with anything that you spray on, make sure that it's not too thick and gunky. Like whenever you spray paint on certain things, it kind of starts to drip. So I've never, I've never used spray Mod Podge. They sell that? Or maybe she's asking, um, like maybe you can make it. Like a varnish or something? Yeah. DIY I Mod Podge. <laughs> um, okay. I have a question. Or sir, yes. We Can are you, almost yeah. out of time, but okay. You talk. I'm just, trimming this, I'm just trimming this down. Like I said, it's not perfect. I just go around the circle, and I can always like fix up a little bit later on. And I'm going to put it right in place there. And that's how I end up getting my circles. It's not stuck in place, but that's how I get my circles by just simply eyeing it. They're not perfect circles. So. Um, I wanted to ask as a, um, since you've been an educator here, yes. working in the school since the late eighties, yes. um, we're going through a lot of changes currently. Mm -hmm. um, have you noticed any changes since the time when you started until the current times and also are there any things like looking forward um, any kind of changes that you're anticipating or how we should how you feel I guess in this current moment um, to answer the first part of the question there have been so many changes with education when I was teaching when I first started we had so much more freedom we still have testing, but we weren't so constricted by the testing. Um, my classes that I taught, they were GT students and special ed students, everybody was in there. And I treated all my kids the same. And I would teach to the middle and higher. By that, I mean, I didn't dumb down the curriculum. Yes, you might've struggled, but that meant it was up to me to sit with you more to make sure I get you to be at the level that you need to be at. So I think that that's kind of changed because our really, really bright students they're not necessarily being fed academically the way that they need to be fed. They're, they're covering content, they're doing activities, but is the education meaningful and relevant? And when I used to do my presentations, I would say it's so important that when we teach like mathematics, don't just teach fractions, but actually teach them how to, to measure out something, bake with them. I mean, truly bring in the, the materials to bake with and you bake. You measure things out. If you're going to build something, make a blueprint. Okay, measure it out. And then do a little, little mock-up of it. That's where the kids really learn it. That's where it's meaningful and relevant. 
When you do your science, okay, take them outside and do the science. Tie in your mathematics and your science. Whenever I was going through being taught as an educator, we did the whole language approach. And that's the only way that I know how to teach. I think everything needs to be connected. And I think nowadays, kids are just covering content and they're not really able to connect that knowledge the way that we want them to. And so, yes, it's changed quite a bit. I mean, especially with COVID that's going on right now, there's a lot of kids that just, they're, they're not getting the education and they need, they need a teacher to be there with them, to guide them, to encourage them. So that's changed a lot too. And I'm hoping that testing will not be as emphasized as it is. Yeah, test, but don't make it the main thing. Make sure that our kids know something by the time that they leave from school. That's what's, what's very important. And also that they're loved by somebody other than their family. So yeah, it's changed a lot. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I will start my video. Um, and so we can say goodbye. Um, is, is there, I guess, one final question. Is there any advice you have for students or a, um, new artists who are barely coming to the trade? Um, any advice for them? I think for anyone, it's, it's so important to pursue your passion. Art's always been my passion and it's always been incorporated in my classroom. Um, you can't, you don't give up on it. It may not yield what you want it to yield, but after all, artists, yeah, we like to make money, don't get me wrong. But I think we really enjoy when people look at the work and they're like, gosh, that's really me. Because you've connected with them. And that's the main thing that I want my art to do is to connect with people. And in my given case, pointing to Jesus. That's what I want my artwork to do. And I think a lot of people, when they see it, they're like, wow, gosh. And they just, they're, they stand there and they look at it. And that's what I want. Have a, pursue your passion. Don't give up on your passion. And if it's art, do your art. It's, some things are worth more than money, right? I'll tell you. <laughs> but yeah. we still need money to survive. Yes. Okay. Well, um, thank you, everybody, for coming and attending the event. And I hope you can come see the exhibit. It's really beautiful in person. It'll be on display through March 23rd. It's at the Pecan Campus Library Art Gallery, the second floor. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. I hope I get to meet you. So we can cut some paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <you> <laughs> Bye. Bye.